Hi, this is David Van Vranken. I want to welcome everybody here to, I think, our 17th lecture here in Chemistry 51C, Organic Chemistry here at UC Irvine. Last, uh, I think it was the night before last, there was a very serious accident in India uh, in the area called Vizag. Uh, and it gives us a chance to talk about radical inhibitors, even in the face of a really uh, serious tragedy. So, uh, it was reported that in the town of Visakhapatnam that there was a leak at a factory that was run by the global conglomerate LG Chemistry, Lucky Gold Star, it's a Korean uh, conglomerate, uh, where there was a leak of the chemical styrene. And you can see over here, coming out of this huge tank, there's some sort of vapor. I assume that's the styrene, that maybe it overheated or something. Styrene shouldn't it was not a gas normally at room temperatures. Uh, but I noted in there that they said, uh, the spread of styrene monomer vapors in the air depends on the wind speed. I, I'm not really that into that aspect of it. But what they said in here is that personnel are working to neutralize the air with chemicals such as 4 tert butyl catechol. And that caught my interest because it's not just that they've got this uh, toxic compounds, certainly toxic at high concentrations, uh, leaking into the air, but they're trying to do some chemistry in the air. If I, if I understand what they're doing, uh, didn't under, wasn't clear to me exactly why they would do that. So it gives us a chance to talk about what they're doing. There's a release of styrene into the air, very serious and, and tragic. People have died, people have been injured. Uh, I, I don't wanna overlook that tragedy, but let's talk about some chemistry. The, uh, of styrene and polymers and radicals. So <clears throat> uh, let's talk about styrene. You're probably familiar with the product of styrene polymerization that they make industrially. Uh, when you polymerize styrene, you make plastics out of that. One of the ones you're most familiar with probably is, uh, is styrofoam, uh, uh, which is made out of polystyrene by blowing gas bubbles in there. It makes it very light. Uh, but generally, when I think of styrene in the laboratory, the plastic ware made out of styrene, I think of brittle plastics, brittle with extremely high clarity, uh, so not quite glass level of, of brittleness and, and toughness, uh, but certainly very clear plastics, uh, polystyrene. And it depends on what kinds of additives you add, copolymers co that you add for to cross linking. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the chemistry of styrene polymerization to make the plastic polystyrene. It's a radical process, and we haven't really spent much time talking about radicals in this class. So generally, if you add some sort of a radical initiator, like peroxides are the one that you guys know about. Benzoyl peroxide is a typical one. If that's how you carried out the polymerization, if you had a tiny, 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 vanishingly tiny amount of an initiator to a bucket of styrene, liquid styrene. What would happen is that you would end up having radicals add to uh, the, the alkene double bond of styrene. Styrene is really just um, a benzene ring with a CC double bond hanging off of the side. You'll add to the less substituted carbon so that you generate a radical that is at the benzylic position and therefore stabilized by resonance with the benzene ring. I didn't draw the phenyl group. Um, and then that radical will then add to another double bond of another styrene molecule and generate a new benzylic radical. And that will continue over and over again to generate polymer chains, thousands and thousands uh, in length, uh, where you have this big carbon backbone with phenyl groups dangling off of that. And that's polystyrene. Ultimately, that will be terminated either if you had exposure to air by trapping an oxygen molecule from water. But when this gets released, styrene gets into the human body Ends up, ends up being epoxidized by a class of human enzymes called cytochrome P450s, uh, generates some really toxic metabolic stuff. Now, when you buy barrels of styrene or if you have a bottle of styrene sitting around on the shelf, they add stabilizers to those. They add radical inhibitors, and these are invariably phenolic compounds because that OH bond of a phenol really wants to donate a hydrogen atom to oxygen radicals to peroxy radicals, to carbon radicals, to, un to oxygen radicals like this initiator that I've drawn here. And so when you include stabilizers like phenolic compounds and these barrels of 
of styrene, as soon as you generate any kind of a radical initiator, it immediately gets quenched or, or trapped by having a phenolic compound like 4-T-butylcatechol donate a hydrogen atom to that radical initiator. So when you do that, you generate a new radical that's so stable that it doesn't add to the styrene and it won't initiate polymerization, it does other stuff. So th this is a pretty clever way to stop radicals from initiating polymerization. Again, if you let one molecule of an initiator into this barrel, that whole thing's gonna be solid plastic and you won't be able to sell it to anybody. So um, that's why you typically add 4-T-butylcatechol to uh, styrene that you buy. But once you release styrene into the air, it's not clear to me why you would want to s inhibit polymerization. You're not trying to protect the styrene floating around in the air that's killing people. I would kind of want the, the, the styrene to degrade. I wouldn't want to preserve the styrene that's floating around killing people. I'm not quite sure why they were trying to stabilize the styrene that's floating around in the air. Um, really sad. I, I feel for the people uh, in Vizag that were uh, affected by this incident. Uh, but an interesting chance to talk about uh, radical polymerization and the role of phenolic inhibitors in, in stopping polymerization reactions from occurring. When we left off on Wednesday, I told you about this amazing and powerful reagent, lithium diisopropyl amide, that magically gives you an instantaneous quantitative yield of enolate. And moreover, it's completely regioselective when you've got differing steric hindrance on each side of your carbonyl group. So it will selectively deprotonate the side that has only one substituent versus the side that has two substituents. Let's go ahead and talk about what are the implications if you use a weaker base, like an alkoxide base, uh, what are the implications for the regiochemistry of enolate formation? So when we use LDA, when we've got differing steric hindrance on each side of the carbonyl, this is a case where the acidity of the CHs at both of these alpha positions is equal. The extra methyl group here doesn't really change the acidity or the relative acidity. Both sides would have a pK of about 20. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it completely, uh, you can completely control the regiochemistry because LDA is, sto is so sterically hindered. So in this case, you would generate one and only one enolate in quantitative yield. I'll go ahead and draw the lithium. Maybe I'll draw the bond there uh, attached to the enolate. But you get a completely different situation if you use an alkoxide base. An alkoxide base is somewhere in the order of, uh, of 20 orders of magnitude, less basic than uh, LDA, than an amide base. So if I take the same substrate in this case, the same, I just haven't drawn the C's and the H's here, and I treat this with an alkoxide base like sodium ethoxide. Let me go ahead and draw that out. You might have considered that a powerful nucleophile and a powerful base way back when people were talking about SN2 reactions, but really <laughs> nothing like an amide anion base like LDA. When you treat uh, this kind of a ketone or an ester or some other carbonyl compound with sodium ethoxide, and there's only one carbonyl group, we get very little of the actual enolate in solution. Contrast that with up above here using LDA, we get 100% enolate instantaneously. But when we use an alkoxide base, most of it is just sitting there doing nothing. And there's an equilibrium that's going on. And so you get the, the, the enolate in this situation. I'll, I'll draw it with a minus charge here. And moreover, the, the, the enolate that you generate is a mixture of two different enolates. And it is dominated by the more substituted enolate that you really don't see up above here. So in this case, sodium ethoxide is not selective enough um, to deprotonate on the more hindered side. Even if you use T-butoxide, it could not selectively deprotonate one side versus the other. So you end up with this mixture, and you end up with a mixture in low yield because this is an equilibrium deprotonation. Less than about 0.1% of your molecules will be deprotonated, and most of them will be sitting around as carbonyls. You can take this mixture, which is in which the more substituted enolate predominates. I'll write the word major here, and I'll write the word minor. Notice the difference here. In this case, 
with LDA, the less substituted enolate was the only enolate product. Here, our enolate mixture, there's only a tiny amount of enolate is dominated by the more substituted enolate. And so what we'll see later, I'll come back to this, this issue, um, <clears throat> that when you take this, this mixture of enolates and you run these reactions in the presence of an alkylating agent, like methyl iodide, we'll end up forming the, the main product of this reaction will be the product where we end up with a new bond on the more substituted side because it was the major enolate in the reaction. So I'll just write that this is the major product. But really, this is not an efficient process. You, you don't want to be generating enolates when there's carbonyls around because they'll just come back and attack the carbonyl. That's the next chapter. Or if worse yet, your alkoxide anion is going to be doing SN2 reactions on your methyl iodide. These kinds of processes are inefficient generally. So I'll just write that up here so we can remember that. So if you're wondering why I don't talk much about this process of using alkoxides uh, to, to make enolates and then running them in the presence of methyl iodide, you know, I tend to focus on efficient transformations, not inefficient ones. So the book may ask you, how do you generate the more substituted alkylation product? Um, but they're not in, I don't think anywhere are they applying that that's an, that's an efficient process. And that turns out to be a super important issue for synthetic organic chemists. We've been talking about forming enolates, and <clears throat> I want to talk about two different representations of enolates. So here's one representation of the enolate that I kind of like when I'm thinking about chemical reactivity and bond formation. The reason you make enolates is so you can use them to attack things. So it's kind of convenient to see a lone pair on that carbon atom because then it's really easy to remember that that's going to act as a nucleophile. But both resonance structures have their place and are, are useful to draw for different reasons. So again, this, um, you know, this is the alpha carbon here, the carbon right next to the carbonyl. And this, this carbanion resonance structure reminds you, reminds me, all right, me, reminds me that the alpha carbon is a nucleophile. Right? It's kind of nice to be reminded of that effortlessly. But there's also this alternative resonance depiction. It's the same molecule, just choosing to depict it in a different way. And when you draw this, um, this CC double bond, the enolate, like an alkene resonance structure, it reminds you, let me say me, reminds me that the enolate system here, these three atoms, oxygen, carbon, carbon, um, it reminds me that it's planar. And when things are planar, that means they have a top face and a bottom face. And you have to worry about attacking from either face and the implications for stereochemistry. Let's go ahead and take a look at what are the implications for stereochemistry. I'm going to give you an example here where we take um, a, a carbonyl compound, a ketone, that you can only deprotonate on one side because there's no alpha proton when it's a phenyl group attached. If you draw the phenyl group, you see there's no CH on this side. But on this side, we're starting with an optically pure starting material that has a, a particular stereochemistry here at the alpha position. If I assign conjugal prelog uh, stereochemistry, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that would be the S stereochemistry. So um, let me just double check that. Yep, uh, yep, the S stereochemistry. And when we deprotonate this, we're going to generate an enolate that is planar. Let me go ahead and try. I'll struggle to draw that enolate so it looks planar. I'll start off by drawing the, the alkene part of the enolate. So I'm going to draw this, this enolate. I'll try to draw the, the double bond that's closer to us, maybe a little bit bigger, so it'll look kind of three-dimensional there. And then I'll draw one of the substituents going back. When I deprotonate this, for example, using a base, I feel like I want to draw out the arrow pushing for that. How do I get the arrow pushing that leads directly to the enolate? Push the electrons up to the carbonyl push the electrons up to here. And based on that arrow pushing, I need to draw a CC double bond. So now when I draw this, this phenyl group, I'll draw that kind of more towards us. Things that are closer to you when you draw perspective drawings look kind of bigger. So I'm trying to use size here to give you, to convey some idea of, I'll make the closer bond thicker. I'm not trying to draw a dash or wedge. There's no stereochemistry associated with that. And then the, um, or like stereogenic center type stereochemistry. And then I'll draw these other two substituents here. If I pull the proton off, I'll draw the methyl group coming maybe 
closer to you in space, try to give it some three-dimensional look. And then I'll draw that ethyl group back there. I'll try to make it look really small. So I'm trying to indicate that there's two faces to this enolate that we've generated. So if you come in and you, you, you add any kind of an electrophile, including just a proton, it, let's suppose my proton just simply reprotonates and gives back the proton that it just took away, right? I, I just took this proton away, and here's my HB that's, that's floating around here. And so now I can use this, uh, this carbonyl, or it used to be the carbonyl oxygen. Boy, this carbon over here is so nucleophilic. Not the carbon next to the oxygen, it's the carbon one over that used to be the alpha carbon. That's the basic site, that's the nucleophilic site. And so my arrow pushing for this, unfortunately, doesn't show that it's this carbon, or at least when I, this individual arrow simply tells me um, that, um, that the pair of electrons in this pi bond is attacking the proton. We have to look over here to realize that it, the new bond must be forming on this end carbon atom. So if I, if I reprotonate this, this would take me right back to the starting shell I started with. But let me point out that half of the time, the other half of the time, <laughs> your base is going to be floating around and colliding with the bottom face, or your protonated conjugate acid is going to be colliding with the bottom face. Let me draw the arrow pushing for that to indicate that half of the time you're, you're protonating, you'd be protonating from the top with no control, and the other half of the time you'd be protonating from the bottom. I don't want to use two, two different, I can't add two sets of arrows to this, so let me use a different color just so I don't confuse these. So, <clears throat> You, you can't add two different sets of arrows for two different mechanisms to one structure. That's just plain wrong. So the other half of the time, you're adding the proton from the bottom face, and that will give you the enantiomer in this case. It would give you, uh, it would, it would uh, create the opposite configuration at, at this center. So let me go ahead and draw those two products. I've actually drawn one of the products here. It's the starting material, so I'll just redraw that over here. But in fact, all of this is reversible. So you'd get the, um, the proton over here, on the top face, that methyl group would go down, and then there would be an ethyl group on there. I, I could have drawn different combinations of dash and wedge. I'm choosing one of the multiple different combinations. And so this is what we get if we attack from the top face. And if we add the proton from the bottom face, as down here, that would be a different configuration. So let me go ahead and draw that. So in this case, the methyl group would now be on top and the H would be on the bottom face. There's the H. And so if I add the, um, in this case, it would be the, the stereochemistry of this one would be R. If I protonate from the top face, I would get back my S stereochemistry. All of these are in equilibrium. Well, I guess that would depend on the strength of the base, but for a, a typical base where we worry about these issues, um, you'd have an equilibrium situation where you'd be adding protons, taking away protons, adding protons, taking away protons. So this process, if you use a weak base that instantly or, or very quickly re-delivers the proton back to the enolate, that process of, of equilibrating and losing stereochemical fidelity at that position, meaning you start with S and you end up with a mixture, we have a term for that. We refer to that as a pimerization. So, <clears throat> If, if we only have one stereochemistry in the molecule, there's a more specific term for that. It's called racemization. That means you start off with one enantiomer, and whatever the process is, it gives you the other enantiomer. That's referred to as racemization. But if you, have a, if, if you start off with some other stereogenic centers, and you have two stereogenic centers, and only one of them is changing, those would be diastereomers. So the more general term uh, for, for equilibrating a stereogenic center, like one next to a carbonyl, uh, would be a pimerization. So <clears throat> again, you, you have to be careful when you make stereogenic centers next to carbonyls, not to treat those with sodium hydroxide or something that would allow this kind of a, a, a racemization or a pimerization process to occur. Now, the book shows you some more chemistry you can do with carbonyls. I don't want to overemphasize this too much. It's, it's worth talking about, but you can add electrophiles right next to the carbonyl group at that alpha position. And that's kind of the opposite of everything we're learning in this chapter and in the next chapter. Everything we're learning in this chapter, or not everything, most of what we're learning in this chapter and next chapter is, is the theme where you make an enolate, which is nucleophilic, and you use this carbon as a nucleophile. 
what I'll show you is you could also, if you wanted, add a leaving group to the alpha carbon and then use it as an electrophile. So let me show you this, the special recipe that you use if you want to add a bromine leaving group to the alpha position of a carbonyl compound. And the secret conditions are bromine in acetic acid. And you just have to memorize that you need acetic acid as, as the product for this reaction. So now we can do SN2 reactions. As with any enolate chemistry, or, or in this case, it's enol chemistry, we can't control whether the bromine adds to the top face or the bottom face of the intermediate. Let's go ahead and take a look at the mechanism for that reaction. The mechanism is acid catalyzed. I'm not showing you, I'll draw it over here. We usually don't care about the inorganic reagents. At the end of the reaction, you have one full equivalent of hydrobromic acid floating around. That's more powerful than, than hydrochloric acid. So the conditions start off acidic and they get more and more acidic. I don't care what's, what's protonating this in step one. So I'm simply going to draw out uh, for an arrow pushing mechanism, I'm going to draw out a symbolic acid HA. And so if I want to draw out step one, we use that acid to protonate uh, the carbonyl. And that makes that into a much more powerful acceptor. Let me go ahead and draw out that, that protonated carbonyl intermediate oxonium ion. There we go. <clears throat> and now we have A minus still floating around the conjugate base left over from our acid. And that's going to, to deprotonate. It's going to generate the enol. We, we've already gone through the mechanism for acid catalyzed enol uh, formation, equilibration between keto and enol forms. So we already know how this works. So maybe this is kind of a review. And then when we, we draw out this enol, Let's just remember that there's two faces to this enol. And so the bromine, the Br2, can add from the top face or it can add from the bottom face. Um, <clears throat> you get both. So I'll go ahead and draw the arrow pushing for this. Now, way back when, when, you, when we covered the chemistry of alkenes and bromination of alkenes or chlorination of alkenes, we told you that, that CC double bonds attack bromine to give a three-membered cyclic bromonium ion. It's really creepy looking thing with a, a three-membered ring and a Cl plus or a Br, Br plus in there. But enols, these are no regular alkene, right? The lone pairs here on this oxygen are donating into this pi system. And just uh, let me put a dot on here. This carbon atom right here is so strongly nucleophilic. You don't go through a three-membered ring of onium ion intermediate. It just does an SN2 on the bromine. So this is completely different from the mechanism we showed you for for brominating a, a simple alkene, those give you a three-membered cyclic bromonium intermediate. These simply add the bromine to that nucleophilic carbon where I put the dot. You don't have to put the dot for a regular arrow pushing mechanism. I just wanted to draw your attention to that carbon atom. <clears throat> so the next intermediate that we generate, I'm gonna draw that OH bond because I know I'm going to deprotonate that in the next step. Now when we add bromine, we add half the time to the top face, half the time to the bottom face, I'll arbitrarily draw the one where the BR is going up. But you also get the other enantiomer. I don't have room to draw that here, but I would draw that with a dash if I were to draw the full structure. And so that's the next intermediate. We still have BR minus floating around here in this reaction mixture. Uh, since I'm doing an arrow pushing mechanism, I'm not, I'm not going to be specific about whether it's a BR that's pulling that proton off, or is it another carbonyl lone pair that's floating around in solution. We don't really care what's pulling that proton off. So I'm going to symbolize that using, uh, using that A minus as a symbol for something with a lone pair. And we pull the proton off and that's what generates the product uh, in this case. So if you really feel like you wanna add a leaving group next to a alpha to a carbon, this is how you do it. Um, <clears throat> now there's another section in the book that tells you that you can halogenate next to carbonyls under basic conditions where enolates are the dominant species. You can't control those. You get over halogenation. And in the old days, back in the 1950s, they used that halog over halogenation to destroy organic compounds to confirm that you have CH2 or CH3 groups next to carbonyls. We don't do that anymore. We have spectroscopy. <laughs> so this was kind of a curiosity. I'm not going to ask you about how you can ruin your compounds by over halogenating them, but it's still kind of an interesting process. Maybe there's some instructive lessons there. I, I don't ask about that on my exams. It's not, it's not an important type of chemistry nowadays. Not like just alkylating enolates and making CC bonds.
that's important chemistry. So <clears throat> what do we do with a, with a halogen after we put it next to a carbonyl group? <laughs> we do SN2 chemistry with that. So let's go ahead and practice with that. I, I showed you this reaction. Uh, let me go ahead and try to make it look interesting in some way. I'll put a weird freaky looking thiophene group. That's an aromatic ring. It's got about the same aromaticity as benzene. And let's suppose I wanted to put a leaving group here. Maybe, maybe this was my day where I just love sulfur <laughs> compounds or something. So maybe I wanna add a sulfur nucleophile into that position. Well, I better put a leaving group there. What's our secret recipe? It's Br2 and acetic acid. Let's draw that. There we go. And so that's going to add a leaving group, a bromine leaving group to that alpha position, alpha to the carbonyl. I'll go ahead and draw the stereochemistry here. And now we can attack that with nucleophiles. Well, let me go ahead and draw the thylate anion. I love thylate anions as nucleophiles. They're, they're more nucleophilic than alkoxides, but they're less basic, so you get less eliminations as a side reaction. So if we had sodium methane thylate, uh, you know, you could draw a covalent bond there. It's, it doesn't matter. I'm going to draw this out. I would just love to do an SN2 reaction on that and make a, car a new carbon sulfur bond. So if you have a carbonyl compound, you can put leaving groups on there and then do displacements with sulfur. Ooh, I'm running out of room there. With sulfur, with nitrogen nucleophiles, amines. We're going to talk more about that. That's not a great reaction, but it, under some circumstances, you can do that. Azide anion, cyanide anion, those would do great SN2 reactions at that position. So let me just write that uh, write that out to clearly indicate we're just doing SN2 chemistry. There's nothing new about this. Just this secret recipe, uh, bromine and acetic acid for putting halogens alpha to carbonyls. But again, this is really the opposite of what chapter 23 and chapter 24 are really about. Chapter 23 and chapter 24 about making the alpha carbon into a nucleophile, not into an electrophile. Let me show you a, a special reaction of of these alpha bromo carbonyl compounds. So let's go ahead and take an example where we have cyclopentanone and we want to do this bromination, this alpha bromination reaction. You have to be kind of careful about choosing the right substrates for these reactions, right? If I had one methyl group, then I can't really control well whether I get bromination on one side versus the other. This is not LDA. Um, so I'm gonna pick a substrate where there is only one side. <laughs> There's not even any protons on this side to make the enol. So you can only bromine on one side of this particular substrate. So this would be a good substrate for this reaction. Or maybe if it was symmetrical and the sides were equivalent, then I wouldn't worry about it that as much. So this will allow us to brominate at this alpha position here. You get a mixture of stereoisomers in, in this particular case. I'm not sure that that's really important for what I'm going to show you here. I'll write plus E uh, because I don't have enough room or time to draw the other enantiomer with the dashed uh, bond going to bromine. Now, here's a secret reaction we can do to do elimination. You can't just use your average everyday base. You can't add sodium methoxide that would do SN2. You can't use T-butoxide that would do SN2. We're going to use um, a secret recipe that you have to use in order to do eliminations. And why would you want to do an elimination here? Because making enones is important in organic chemistry. Once you have an enone, you can do conjugate addition of cuprates, Remember those lithium dialkyl cuprates from three chapters ago? Um, or you can add to the carbonyl and then be left with a double bond. You can do a zillion reactions with hydroboration, oxidation, epoxidation. So double bonds are valuable. But we have to use a secret recipe here. And that secret recipe is lithium carbonate, Li2CO3, lithium bromide. There's nothing obvious about this. We're not going to draw the mechanism for you. We're not going to tell you what's going on, and you have to do it in, in a solvent called DMF, and an NN dimethylformamide, a superpolar aprotic solvent, and you have to memorize this three reagent combination to do, to, to do elimination reactions of these alpha bromo compounds, and it is super valuable to do that because there's so many functional groups. Don't you feel like you want to add a, a Grignard reagent into the carbonyl or an alkalithium, or don't you feel like you want to add a cuprate in there? 
That's what I feel like when I see those. And next chapter, we're going to show you some more reactions you can do with these enone acceptors, uh, more one four addition type processes that we can do with those. So let's come back to, to lithium enolates and get away from putting leaving groups alpha to carbonyls. That seems kind of weird and obscure to me. Okay, let me go ahead and draw a carbonyl that's an ester. Boy, esters are way less acidic than ketones and aldehydes. Way less acidic. But you know, with an ester, even though it's like 100,000 times less acidic than a ketone, LDA has no problem pulling off a proton here. I, it doesn't matter. You could have R group as a phenyl, a long alkyl chain with 15 carbons. Doesn't matter. We treat this with our secret, with our recipe that I told you you have to memorize. LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees. That's the recipe you have to use for, you have to draw all three things when you use LDA. Um, here, we don't have to worry about regiochemistry, less hindered, more hindered, right? There's only one alpha position. The oxygen has, is not a carbon atom. You can't deprotonate oxygen. So there's only one side to deprotonate here. You know, I can draw multiple different resonance depictions of that enolate. I'm going to draw a resonance depiction that puts a carbanion lone pair right there. There we go. That's one way to, I, or I could also draw, if I wanted, I could have drawn the depiction where I had an alkene and an O minus sticking off of that. So once you make an enolate, here's the key thing that we do in this chapter. I'll, I'll draw brackets around there to indicate you don't ever isolate lithium enolates. You make lithium enolates in the lab, and then as soon as you've made it, an hour after you've you know, you let this stir around at minus 78 for an hour, you come back, and then you treat it with an alkylating agent or carbonyl compound, next chapter, and, and do SN2 reactions. Let me pick a good SN2 substrate, methyl iodide. I love it. There's no worry about elimination with methyl iodide because you don't even have a beta carbon to eliminate from. So you throw in methyl iodide and you get amazing yields uh, for formation of that CC bond with no competing E2 elimination reaction. Now there's two different faces to that enolate and you'll get addition from both the top face and the bottom face of that plane of the enolate. Uh, but right now, I just want to focus on, on that amazing carbon-carbon bond, and you'll get 100% yield of that. So, yeah, so powerful LDA that you can deprotonate next to esters, next to amides. Let me go ahead and draw out an amide. So much less acidic than a ketone. Wow. It's, it's like 10 million times less acidic than a ketone, but we don't have any problem pulling that proton off using LDA. LDA is such a powerful base. THF, minus 78 degrees. Wow. I love it. If you want to make carbon-carbon bonds, which all organic chemists want to make carbon-carbon bonds, this is the way to make carbon-carbon bonds. I'm going to follow this up with a second step here. I'll just write this as step one. I, I like to use Roman numerals little Roman numerals because that, to just to make it clear, you don't isolate anything in between. And then step two, let's add another electrophile here for doing SN2. If we make an enolate here and we add another electrophile for doing SN2, let me add this electrophile, allyl bromide. There's three carbons in allyl bromide. And so I would do an SN2 reaction on allyl bromide. There's the three carbons. Look at that new carbon-carbon bond we generate. And this, this would exist as two different stereoisomers, um, this plus E. So um, I, um, same over here. Why, why don't I just draw that plus E? See how easy it is to make carbon-carbon bonds when you have carbonyls? You, you take your carbonyl compound and you add LDA, THF, minus 78, and then you add an alkylating agent. Now what you're going to find is that I and other organic chemists have three alkylating agents for doing SN2 that we love above all others because they're inexpensive and they don't have competing E2 elimination. Right? No, you, you might have thought, boy, organic chemistry is so hard because SN2, E2 competes with E1 and S1. Organic chemists don't fiddle around with that. We don't use substrates that have an option for elimination. And so we don't spend, waste our time talking about that confusing business. And so here are my, some of my favorite alkylating agents for alkylating enolates, methyl iodide, right? You can't form an alkene from this because there isn't a second carbon. So there's no worry about a competing E2 elimination. When you take powerful nucleophiles like enolates 
and you react them with methyl iodide, you won't have any competing eliminations. You're just going to generate clean carbon-carbon bonds and high yield. So we love that. Benzylic bromide. Look, there's no alpha hydrogens there or beta hydrogens. So there's, there's no way to do an elimination by pulling a proton off of here because there are no protons. So I'll say no beta Hs. You are simply not going to form. Uh, um, it's impossible to do an elimination with this. You're only going to get clean SN2 if you alkylate enolates with, with, benz, with benzyl bromide or benzylic bromides. The other substituents on there don't stop you from getting, if you had other substituents on the benzene ring, you'd still get clean SN2 reactions. And then allobromide is the one that's a little bit, you wouldn't have guessed it, I don't think, that it turns out that when you have nucleophiles in here, they only give you SN2. You never get compete. There is a proton here, but you find that you never, when you have carbon nucleophiles, you never deprotonate and eliminate to make this weird species called an alene that you might have seen back in chapter 10 when they talked about alkynes. Um, I'll just tell you that doesn't ever happen. It's not that it's impossible, but with carbon nucleophiles that it just can't happen. It won't, won't ever happen. You get clean SN2, allobromide, I love it. No SN2, that's like the world is wonderful when you choose substrates that can't do competing E2 eliminations and all you get is SN2. Um, <clears throat> so isn't it great when we don't have to worry about B2 and SN2 and all that other business Boy, that was a confusing nightmare. If you thought that was confusing, I do too. <laughs> why did they, why do they teach you something that people never have to worry about? Um, <clears throat> maybe it's to make you appreciate those three alkylating agents more. All right, <clears throat> let's go ahead and look at how, how useful this enolate business is because <laughs> again, when you look at the way modern or synthetic organic chemistry is done, <clears throat> Again, we're not sitting spending our time worrying about uh, E2 eliminations and carbon-carbon bond formation is so easy. And that's really the essence of organic chemistry. Organic compounds have carbon-carbon bonds. It's kind of, it's not just they contain one carbon atom, they contain carbon-carbon bonds. And so organic chemists love to build drugs, um, drug molecules or other functional molecules by, by building carbon-carbon bonds. Let's go ahead and take a look how if you had uh, <clears throat> alpha, protons at the alpha carbon, we can successively replace those with carbon-carbon bonds. So if I wanted to make this, uh, I don't know how many different orders there are, but we've got three different substituents and we have our choice as to which one we want to add first. Let's go ahead and take a, an example, just co completely arbitrarily, let's say I wanted to add the methyl group first. What's, let's just practice, what's our recipe? LDA to deprotonate and THF minus 78 degrees. And you might say, well, I don't want to write all that. Tough luck. You've got to just memorize those three things and get used to using them without flinching, just automatically. LDA, it's not just LDA, it's LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees. And now if we wanted to, now that we've made an enolate out of that, if we want to replace it with a carbon-carbon bond, let's add one of our great alkylating agents, methyl iodide. <clears throat> I can draw the methyl group anywhere. I'm just going to draw it there. So now we've made a nice new carbon-carbon bond. I could have added the allo group first or the benzyl group first, but it's kind of arbitrary, the order. Now, if I want to make a, a second carbon-carbon bond, I remove one of the other two protons. Step one, LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees. Why do we use minus 78? Because that's the temperature of dry ice sublimation. So you just jump, dump some dry ice into acetone and it and it's, uh, generates a bath that you can stick your flask in that's automatically minus 78 degrees. It's not like the reaction wouldn't occur at minus 80 or, or, or minus 40 degrees, but every lab has dry ice sitting around and that's just a convenient temperature. And why do we use methyl iodide and not methyl bromide? Because we like to use liquids. We don't like to use gas and methyl bromide's a gas. And it's just not convenient to grab a gas tank and stick it into your reaction, bubble it into your reaction. So we methyl iodide. If you had methyl bromide, it would work. Um, <clears throat> methyl chloride probably, but not quite as reactive in SN2. So if we want to next add benzylic bromide, so we quite often will abbreviate benzyl bromide like this. 
but that's really mean if you wanted to draw out the chemical structure, right, that would be this. Don't forget that carbon. You couldn't do this with phenyl bromide if the bromide was directly attached to the, the benzene ring. Totally impossible. You couldn't form a benzene, form a bond with an enolate directly to a, a, a phenyl group. Right? This is a benzylic carbon, so you can do SN2 attack uh, at a benzylic carbon. So that would add our, our benzylic carbon-carbon um, bond on there. Here we go. Right, that methyl group's still there. And there's now one H left over on here, and we can pull that off. What are we going to use to deprotonate? You guessed it. Step one, LDA, THF, minus 78 degrees. If you want to draw commas and, and draw them all on one line, that's fine too. Step two, we need an alkylating agent with three carbons. That's that allobromide thing. <clears throat> I find for some reason that when people draw the products of allylic alkylation, they really often forget to draw this carbon atom. And you're saying, oh, I'm not gonna forget to draw that carbon atom. Van Rankin's crazy. I promise you, there's just gonna be people on the exam, somewhere on some exam I'm going to give, and this is in every section, they're gonna alkylate and enolate with allobromide. And students will forget to draw this carbon atom here. They'll, they'll draw a, a CC double bond directly attached to the alpha carbon because it's a common mistake. And, and you may be thinking, oh, I'll never make that mistake. I, some of you are gonna make that mistake, even though I'm telling you that it's a common mistake. And, and it's just hard to, I don't know, it just seems kind of hard to see that you need to add three carbons instead of two. And I don't know why, I don't know why that's, that's true, why that's a, a common mistake. Okay, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, um, Go ahead and uh, just walk through a little bit here. Sorry, I've got to get my, uh, i got another screen here. That, that it has the, the notes on here that remind me of what I wanted to talk about. So, you know, we use LDA. We just have to be very careful not to have OHs sitting around. Lithium disopropyl amide, sodium amide, those are such powerful bases, just like T-butylithium. You would never expose those. If you're trying to deprotonate next to a carbonyl, then you don't want to have other competing OHs around in solution. So LDA is selective for the less substituted side. So if we have two different carbonyl sides and one side has more alkyl groups than the other, these two CHs have about equal acidity. That extra methyl group doesn't change the acidity here enough for LDA. LDA deprotonates only on this side, right? It would, it would only deprotonate here because of steric hindrance. Over here on this ester, LDA is only going to deprotonate on this side because there are no protons on the oxygen for you to worry about. So there's really only one, and there's no way you would protonate if you're not next to a carbonyl, so this methyl group. O over here at this longer substrate, right, I've got, I want to look at the, the, the protons on this next to the carbonyl. That's this proton here, the, this carbon atom here, and the carbon atom here. But LDA is hindered. It will go after the protons on the least hindered side. So I expect you to know that. If, if you use just sodium amide, probably it would deprotonate half the time on either side. Uh, but LDA has isopropyl groups. It's very bulky, so it selectively deprotonates here. Uh, this is not, I don't know, you, you generally would not use a trimethyl silo protecting group. The protecting group that you use is tert-butyl dimethyl silo, or TBDMS. Um, maybe I was trying to oversimplify that there, but. It's just not common to, trimethyl silo groups fall off too easily, so we use T-butyl dimethyl silo. Okay, over here with this amide, again, we look right next to the carbonyl, there's a nitrogen atom on one side, there's no protons on it, and then there's a carbon atom on the other side. There's only one place you can deprotonate here, and that's right here at this position. There's no, no worry, and there's no worry about deprotonating methyl, just because it's next to a heteroatom, that doesn't make it acidic. Being next to a carbonyl makes you acidic not being next to an oxygen atom, that doesn't make anything acidic. You have to be next to a carbonyl. Now, if we have other functional groups that are more acidic, regiochemistry has nothing to do with the issue that's going on here. LDA always deprotonates the more acidic thing faster. So over here we have an OH, this is where, that's <laughs> so much more acidic than the alpha carbon of an ester. These protons over here have a pK around 25, this is a pK of five, 20 orders of magnitude more acidic. LDA is not gonna mess around with CHs if there's a carboxylic acid 
it's an acid floating around in solution. Similarly, if we have alcohols, you know, the pK of ketones is 20, this is, a, is it like 10,000 times more acidic, you, you're gonna instantly deprotonate your alcohol, you're not going to see any protonation next to the carbonyl. So again, you, what would you do if you, if you wanted to do enolate chemistry with this? And let me recommend that you convert that into a silyl ether first. You know the conditions. It's tert-butyl dimethyl silyl chloride, TBDMS chloride. I don't think that sapling homework system or testing system allows you to abbreviate a reagents like this. If you drew out the structure of that reagent, the, the chemical structure of that silylating reagent would look like this, um, tert-butyl dimethyl silyl chloride. Um, if you wanted to do enolate chemistry, you have to protect that OH first. You can't, you can't be doing enolate chemistry when there's OHs on your molecule or anywhere in your reaction mixture. And finally, with amides, uh, like this carboxamid group right here, if you have a carboxamid with an NH or two NHs on it, that's too acidic. That has an acidity very similar to water or to alcohols. And so you would instantly deprotonate it, and that's it. You've just destroyed your LDA. So LDA would deprotonate here, and you're not going to be doing any enolate chemistry if you wasted your LDA deprotonating that NH. Uh, so I wouldn't ask you that. We, you know, we have potential strategies for protecting those nitrogen atoms. We're not going to talk about any of that this quarter. Uh, but just recognize that you, you can't make enolates from amides if the amide has an NH on there. It's only like when you have two alkyl groups on the amide and there's no three NHs. Okay, I, I expect you to know where LDA deprotonates. <clears throat> Let's come back over and, and talk a little bit more about <clears throat> regiochemistry. LDA is so sterically hindered. It's so powerful, but it's sterically hindered. And so you get selectivity. So <clears throat> remember that LDA deprotonates on the less hindered side. So if I had a methyl group on my carbonyl compound, and I'm giving you a, a particular instance where uh, that's part of a stereogenic center. I mean, the methyl group could have been here and been a stereogenic center. Methyl group could have been here, and it's not a stereogenic center but there's a difference between top face and bottom face after you add a second alkyl group. Let's go ahead and take a look at the implications of creating a new stereogenic center. So when we initially deprotonate with LDA, we get a planar enolate, but this particular one had a, a methyl group attached to a stereogenic center. And it had a single configuration, which was the R configuration. It's still R when you make the enolate. And after we, if we do an alkylation, I'll use methyl iodide because it's small and easy for me to draw. <clears throat> if we do an alkylation with methyl iodide, we're going to generate a new stereogenic center. And we can't control, you might think, oh, well, the methyl group's kind of on the top. Maybe that there won't be enough steric hindrance. About half of the time, this new methyl group will add from the top face. And then the other half of the time, the methyl group will add from the bottom face. And so you have to recognize that you formed a new stereogenic center without control. So you get a mixture of those and they're not enantiomers. So one, one product we get would have the methyl group on the top face, 50% of your product would have this. The other 50% of your product would have the methyl group on the bottom face, the new methyl group. And those aren't enantiomers. You can't write plus E. You can't write plus E on the sapling system anyways. Those are diastereomers. They're not enantiomers. They're not mirror images of each other. So let's just be clear that these, these two molecules have a diastereomeric relationship. Diastereomers. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't fit that in there. So <clears throat> yeah, big, if, the, if you have a pre-existing stereogenic center, if the other stereoisomer you generate is not a mirror image, then they're stereoisomer, they're diastereomers of each other. <clears throat> now, it, there's a, the, the book tries to indicate to you that when you use this lane based T butoxide, oh, and nothing like LDA, and you generate a small amount of the, at equilibrium, you generate a tiny amount of, of, this, of this enolate, that the enolate that dominates in solution of, you know, only 1% of this is, is deprotonated in solution. So maybe I should just indicate that. It's not like LDA, you just generate a tiny amount 
going back and forth. The t-butanol repronates it, goes back and forth. And the, the enolate that's mainly present is the more stable one, is this more substituted enolate. So when you use this weak base, and in some cases, you can get alkylation faster than the t-butoxide attacks your alkylating agent. The small amount of this enolate that's present can, can generate some of, uh, of this more substituted substitution product. We call this the thermodynamic enolate. With, with t-butoxide, you don't generate very much enolate, but the one that is present is the, is the thermodynamic enolate that's more substituted. So when you use t-butoxides, um, <clears throat> you can sometimes get the more sub. you know, uh, when you use t-butoxide, you can sometimes get the enolate uh, to alkylate, and if it does, it's gonna be the more substituted one that's doing the chemistry. So notice the difference here that when I used LDA and I got 100% of this in solution, it was all the enolate that was at the, at the uh, less substituted position. But if we use t-butoxide, we can get um, <clears throat> we can get the the al the new alkyl group the alkylation to occur at the more substituted side. So you get two very different products here. In this particular case, I started with a methyl group and I end up with a methyl group. So you're not those are indistinguishable. So you don't generate a new stereogenic center. So again, that's a key difference. LDA you'll get high yields but you always get substitution at the less uh, substitute, you also, you always get alkylation at the less substituted side. T-butoxide, you get substitution or alkylation at the more substituted side, but yields are generally not as good for this procedure. So you don't see this being used very much nowadays. Uh, I'm not sure how much the book asks you questions about that in the back of the chapter. I wish they didn't really discuss that because that's really taking you back to 50 years before we had LDA. <laughs> Uh, we have other tricks or other ways to do that kind of chemistry nowadays. <clears throat> okay, let me take you back in history, back to the way we used to do reactions with enolates before the invention of LDA. You know, before we had really powerful bases, if you don't have a very powerful base, you have to make your carbonyl compound more acidic, and that's what they did. So way back in the day, in the 1960s and the 1950s and the 1940s, we used compounds that are so acidic, that are just so acidic and easy to protonate. So this, with two carbonyls acidifying the same CH2 group, those have pKa's about 13. That's more acidic than water. These CH's are more acidic than water. So now you can use a, a, a pathetic base like a thoxide anion to deprotonate it. You don't need LDA when, when you've got super acidic compounds that have two carbonyls two esters or an ester and a ketone or two ketones or an ester. Cyano groups have about the same acidifying effect as an ester, so you get an ester and a cyano group. These we can use a base like sodium ethoxide in order to generate a, um, an enolate that's very heavily stabilized by resonance. So one of the H's would be removed and I'm not going to draw all the resonance structures. There's two important resonance contributors where, where we push the electrons up into the O minus. So th this is, again, you don't need a powerful base for this reaction because the enolate is so stable, it can't deprotonate the ethanol byproduct. So if you just had one carbonyl compound on there, it would yank the proton right back off the ethanol and go backwards, but this is so stable. You can't protonate this with water. You dump it in water and it'll just sit there. Kind of amazing, isn't it? But you, even though you can't protonate that with water because it's not basic enough, it can still form carbon-carbon bonds with SN2 reactions. That's pretty amazing. So I'll put in my, my kind of small, super simple methyl iodide electrophile, and that can now do SN2 reactions. So who would have thought that, that, that an enolate that is so heavily stabilized um, that it's less basic than, than a thoxide or hydroxide is still good enough for doing SN2 reactions. You couldn't have guessed that. Uh, that's why uh, I have to just tell you that that's nucleophilic enough to, to form carbon-carbon bonds. 
And here the two esters are identical, so we don't generate a new stereogenic center because there's not four different groups attached to this carbon. Um, so <clears throat> this is what we used to do. We call this part, uh, this used to be part of a synthetic strategy uh, that we used to have for alkylating alpha to carbonyls. Because once you do this, nobody really wants to have two carbonyls on, on right next to one carbon atom. That's, that's not what you want. But this used to be the only way to do alkylations because we didn't have powerful bases. And then the first thing people tried to do is get rid of that extra carbonyl. And here's the way we do that. We have a secret reaction where when, we, when you take diesters or any carbonyl that has an extra ester next to it, this could be a ketone, this could be an amide, uh, but when you treat those uh, with HCl, and, and really the, the key feature of this reaction is that it hydrolyzes, well, in this, in this case, it hydrolyzes both sides to carboxylic acids. Oh, I'm running out of time here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop right there. And I'll show you that when we come back that you can, uh, you can decarboxylate those um, and remove that, that annoying extra carbonyl group. Sorry I went over my time, and you guys spend the weekend going through reactions. We're working on your next exam, trying to make it the same format as our previous exam, because now that you're used, uh, trying to get you confident that we're using the same format of, of, of sapling exams, so you can spend more time thinking about the chemistry, less time thinking about uh, the, 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 the intricacies and idiosyncrasies of the sapling system. So have a great weekend, stay healthy, stay sane. Sorry I went over my time.